test, 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 test. All right. Um, looks like they do have the IT equipment back up. So um, um, I am here, although nobody's uh, here at the classroom. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and start the session here. Uh, actually, I need to set up a few things. So I'm going to pause just a second while I set up. So, oh, uh, again, we have somebody on here. So um, give me a second. Um, um, I'm setting up some stuff. Um, we do have the IT equipment back up, it looks like. Um, so it was working again um, at the uh, physical classroom. Um, let me pause the recording. All right, um, so let's go ahead and begin the session here. Um, so as usual, you know, I'll let, if people have questions, I'll let um, um, you guys ask them and I'll, and, you know, I'll drive the sessions that way. Um, I was thinking about talking about the problem set two a little bit. Um, I have one thing in particular I wanted to talk about, about the threading example. Um, and then we can talk about assignment three. So I've had a few people asking some questions about um, uh, the assignment three and, um, a ready queue and some things like that. So you should be working on the assignment three that is due coming up due at the end of this week here um, for our um, this particular unit. Um, so. I'm not going to say a lot about the first question. You guys can um, uh, kind of read my description. I mean, a lot of people um, were not really given great answers on this, although I didn't take off a whole lot for, for um, particular things. So, I mean, it was obvious a lot of people were kind of working from a totally unrelated question having to do with um, uh, if you have compute bound versus uh, IO bound processes, um, you know, um, how does that affect uh, CPU scheduling, which is another question um, that um, you might get, but but that wasn't this question. So, so that, I mean, the, the most obvious thing for this one is that um, uh, some sort of a modification, like, like you, you so, so you wanna have something that um, um, penalizes, um, some processes that are swapped out, okay, that are suspended. Um, so if it's highest priority, you might not want to swap it in uh, immediately, especially if you have a, a lot of ready processes that are almost as high a priority, right? So an obvious thing is, is to do some sort of a penalty. Um, so for example, you could say that, that the effective priority is reduced by one or two or however many levels make sense for things that are suspended. So, so take them down a couple of priority levels, right? Uh, and an even more sophisticated mechanism would be to use that also with some sort of aging mechanism. So uh, have some initial uh, priority set with a penalty, but that, that penalty maybe decays um, uh, the longer something is in a suspended state. So a high priority process that's not getting selected, uh, that's suspended, um, um, uh, maybe if you decay that, eventually it will become the highest priority even with a penalty or once the penalty completely decays away, at which point you'll swap it in even though you know it takes some time to swap it in. So, so that, that was a kind of the discussion I was looking at for there. So, um, I wanna talk about this because this is a, I, I really like this question because this is a good setup for um, our next unit on concurrency mechanisms, so semaphores and things like that. Um, so um, I wanted to point out that um, um, let me uh, let me get my um, dev box running here. So I already got my dev box running. Go to the usual 127.001 port 8080 to get into the dev box. Uh, let me close off this folder. 
Um, I'm sure I've mentioned this. Um, Um, in some places um, on our B2L, but um, um, all the code examples or some code examples uh, you can find in our repository. So, um, you know, so all of the assignments are under assignment, but um, um, there should be a subdirectory called example um, that you'll have. So in particular, uh, like for problem set two, the, um, um, the threading example um, is in here, and, and you can you can actually compile and run these. Um, so, for example, let's. Uh, the basic um, um, threading example is um, uh, the, the basic uh, uh, threaded program from problem set two is in the Prompt set zero two dash race dot cpp in our example subdirectory. Um, so um, let me open up that folder here. So because I think that there's a build system that will build everything here if we do this. So. Um, Originally, you were given it with a number of iterations of 25 for the loops. And um, uh, we weren't using this uh, micro sleep. So I guess this is a little bit different. I thought I had a version that was exactly the same. Uh, maybe not. Um, I'll just leave that there. So. So this should be pretty similar if we set the number of iterations for these loops to be 25. And if we use, instead of sleep, we use micro sleep, but we'll sleep for a thousand, which should sleep for one second, a thousand microseconds, uh, or does that need to be a million? Um, maybe, maybe that needs to be a million to sleep for a second. Um, but we should be able to build this with the same, um, and maybe not. Uh, I guess the, we need to build this from the uh, from a terminal. Um, I thought we had the keyboard shortcut set up for this, but maybe not. So if you open up a terminal and, and you do a, a, a make, um, it should build these. Um, so in particular, uh, this problem set zero two race gets output to a um, executable called PS02, which you should be able to run. Um, now, if you run it, um, you should get the, the same result that we were, or, or a similar result. Um, you know, so you'll notice that um, you don't always get these exactly uh, interleaved. So sometimes uh, you get two O's. So one of the things I was looking for was people to discuss when they were discussing the differences. So this is just a cosmetic difference, but um, the, uh, the the thread function outputs dots um, onto the C out and the main function loop outputs O's onto C out. So, so this is, you can see uh, kind of uh, when um, that line of code was run from the main function, when you see the O's, um, you can see when the um, this line of code was run from the, uh, the thread function here, when you see the dots. So in this case, you know, the, the main loop ran twice in a row um, uh, between subsequent executions of the thread function. Um, and at, at the end, we still had three remaining thread functions that hadn't run. So it ran three times in a row and so on. If, if you run this multiple times with, um, uh, and, and yeah, that, uh, that must, must need to be like a million because uh, these are microseconds. So, um, if I were to micro sleep for a millionth, a million microseconds, that would be like sleeping for a second. So um, if you do it like in, um, it was shown in the um, uh, problem set, you will be more likely if, if you're sleeping for a full second uh, to, to get a, a pretty good interleaving, not always, but um, 
but I guess you, you would be more likely to get it than what I was showing uh, when we were sleeping for much less of a time here. So, uh, but you will, you'll definitely be very likely to get um, 26 as the result, although you don't necessarily have to get 26. You can get 25 or 27. Um, I mean, you can actually get any result from one or maybe zero, zero, one, up to 50 uh, for this program, right? Um, but um, I think the reason why I had that change before was just because I don't want to wait around for doing this multiple times. So let's let's make the the, the, the sleep much um, slower here, right? Um, so So yeah, if we make the, the, the time that it sleeps much slower, um, I'm trying to see if I, if I can show you an example of getting something besides 26. Pretty consistently get 26, don't we? Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, there's nothing forcing these to always, you know, uh, switch exactly back and forth. So you run one iteration of this loop and then switch over and run one iteration of this loop and go back and forth between them. So there's so, no synchronization mechanisms in here. Um, so, I mean, at, at the heart of this, um, and, and I described this in the solution, uh, another thing I was looking for, uh, so there's explicit questions. So what does the sleep do? So from our chapter three and chapter four on process states, Sleep is an example of a voluntary blocking event. So when you call sleep, you're telling the operating system, I wanna be blocked uh, for a particular amount of time. And once that time period has expired, I wanna be woken back up and put back into a ready state, okay? So by calling sleep, you're putting, in this case, you're putting the particular thread that you call the sleep um, into a blocked state. Um, and then a timer is set uh, so that an interrupt occurs somewhere in the computing system the operating system after that amount of time that you specify elapses. Uh, and then when that time elapses, the event um, is sent in order to unblock that thread and put it back into a ready state. Okay, This is all stuff that we're working on for our simulation two, for example, as well, uh, for our process states, uh, simulating going between ready, running, and blocked, right? So this is another example of kind of a voluntary block, okay? So instead of doing IO, um, we, we say that I want to block myself for a particular amount of time. So, um, so that was another thing I was kind of looking for in the discussion. Um, so if I make this really small, um, sleep time, you'd be more likely to get um, um, variation. So, but again, it's, it's a bit tough with only 50. So um, if we increase the iterations, let's make it uh, 2,500 or maybe 25,000. So for 25,000, there should be a total of, of 50,000 iterations, right? Um, and if, if the my global was being incremented on all 50,000 of those iterations, we would expect a final result in my global to be 50,000. So when we were doing 25 each, uh, if each one of these uh, increments, um, so, so we get the value out of my global, increment it, and put that value back. Uh, likewise, um, on the main thread, we are incrementing um, my global by one. So, so both of these should have the effect of incrementing my global by one. So if I'm only doing 25 iterations each, I would expect to get a result of 50 into my global. If I'm doing 25,000, like I'm doing now, we should get 50,000. Um, and th at this point, um, I might have to remove the, um, uh, the output here, but um, so as you can see, the, we, we get 25,003. So um, um, pretty close to 25,000. So, so somehow we're, we're losing almost all, but not completely all of one of these uh, increments, right? And, and here uh, with, with a lar larger number of loops and a, a small time, you should see more variation um, on uh, the output. So 25,001 that time, 
Um, actually, maybe if the um, sleep time was a bit longer, that might cause a bit more vari variability on the um, output here. It will also depend on the speed of your computer and, and what operating system you've got running on your host and, and what other stuff you got running, stuff like that. So. So anyway, so a little bit of variation, but 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 not a whole lot. But but I mean, it can vary in theory uh, quite a bit. Um, uh, any of the range from one to like fifty thousand. Um, so let's make this really extreme. Let's let's make it like uh, sleep just for one microsecond. Um, put this up to um, two hundred fifty thousand. So we're expecting like half a million, um, five hundred thousand uh, loop iterations to happen. Uh, and that will give me so much output. I'm going to go ahead and um, remove uh, sending stuff to the output and flushing it. Um, both of these here. So uh, that might have been too long. So uh, uh, even removing the outputs and having very small sleep time. Um, it's gonna take a while to do half a million on my computer. I didn't think it'd take that long, but um, uh, there it goes. So, um, so we only get 250,000 in two here. Uh, I'm gonna go back to 25,000. Thousand four, thousand one, where's that seven there? So, um, I think it is, I have to think about it, and I think it is possible to get less than 25,000. Um, is that true? Maybe not. So, so, maybe, maybe the actual range is 25,000 or 25,001 up to 50,000 here. So, um the thing I wanted people to realize uh, on this question from our textbook is, you know, so, so, so the basic issue is that um, this update of the global variable, so, so the global variable represents a shared um, uh, memory location that, that's being updated uh, by two different threads um, simultaneously, but there's no synchronization mechanisms to ensure that they don't interfere with, with updating that value. So, so basically what happens most of the time, and, and you know, we explicitly set it up for this, is that we read the value out of my global. So whatever it is, let's say the, the value of, of my global is zero currently, the very first time. So we read it out. So J would be zero, we increment it by one. But before we update it to, add, to increment it by one, remember my global is still zero, we sleep, which gives the other thread a chance to run. So when the other thread runs, uh, it will find my global to still be zero and it might increment it and finish doing its increment. In fact, since it increments before it sleeps, um, it's likely to get the value out, increment it and, and save it back to one. But then the problem is, is that now when we return from sleep here, um, assuming that we get control back because the other thread slept after actually incrementing my global to one, uh, my global is one, but J is one as well. So we just assign one back over J. So we end up losing the increment a lot of the time because of the way that we set this up here, right? And as most people, um, or well, some people, and I gave full credit for this, uh, an obvious way to, to uh, mostly fix this um, is just to increment my global, kind of what looks like you're incrementing it um, atomically before the sleep in both functions, all right? So what effect does that have? Um, I'm gonna go back to 25 here. Um, oh, we're not using the J anymore. So I'm gonna complain about that. Let's get rid of that one. So um, do that, that will um, 
often looks like it, it fixes the problem. Right, so now we're actually both loops are incrementing uh, each time through the loop iteration, right? Um, and even if we um, do a lot more loop, well, if we do a lot more loops, though, um, you should find maybe somewhat surprising. Um, so we got fifty thousand that time, thousand. So it still looks like it's doing it um, just fine. So now I'm doing 500,000 or half a million loops here. I may have to try up up in the, the the sleep time. Let me try one more time. Um, uh, okay, let's try changing the um, sleep time a little bit. So. Uh, let me go back down to 25,000. So by, by um, well, in this case, yeah, I mean, playing around with the sleep time um, probably won't have an effect. In fact, uh, let me go the opposite direction. Let's make it zero. Let's go up to... 500,000 each, so a million total. Hopefully I can get this to demonstrate here. What I'm trying to demonstrate, I've, I've got a pretty fast computer, um, so it makes it a little bit uh, less likely for this to occur here. So uh, you'd be more likely to get this if you have a computer with um, um, less processing speed and, and some other issues. Um, yeah, sure. Probably one more, but I'm probably you might have to end up taking my word for it. So it is still possible um, to get a value not equal to a million in this case, where we're running each iteration five hundred thousand. Even though we're both, um, I, I've changed both of the loops to uh, increment my global um, before we sleep, basically. So they're both doing kind of something uh, symmetrically here. Um, and that's, that's because, oh, there, so we finally got it. Uh, so so, so we, we lost one somehow there. So, so how did that happen, right? So, so why, why did we get that uh, bug here for this threaded program? Um, that happens because, I mean, even though doing the solution, which, which was, you know, I think maybe 33 to 50% of the people kind of came up with this or something similar, um, and that was kind of what I was expecting most people to think of at this point, right? But these, these instructions really aren't atomic, right? So, so you have to remember that, that C is a high level language that gets compiled down to machine language. So, so an instruction like this probably gets compiled down into at least three machine instructions. So we'll have something to like load the value from my, from my global in RAM. So, so my global will be assigned some location in memory whenever you create a global variable like this, so some, somewhere in your computer's memory in RAM. So, uh, so we'll first have to fetch or load the value from RAM into like a register, like, like uh, register A if we're on in Intel, so, so the general purpose register A. So, so load my global into register A, then we have to add one to A uh, and put the result back in A. So that, that's you know, at least one more machine instruction to do the add. And then we would have to store the result of A back out to memory to my global, okay? 
And the problem is, is that, um, you know, so, so those instructions aren't atomic. So, so the, the, the exact same steps that I had here, where we, we loaded the value from my global into somewhere, incremented that value and then stored it back out. I mean, that really happens on, on the machine level, um, um, even though this kind of looks like an atomic instruction, you know, an instruction that all happens in one step uh, at, at the high level C programming um, language level, right? Um, but, you know, again, the, 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 the fundamental problem is still there. So it could happen that I, I've, I've loaded the value into a register and I've incremented the value, but then I get interrupted and um, I switch over to the other thread, right? Before switching back. And in that case, we would lose in exactly the same way here. We would, we would lose an increment, right? Um, and the more iterations you do, the more likely you you're are, even with this particular fix, to see a couple of, um, of increments lost in total. Uh, while this greatly reduces the, the chance of, of seeing this, this is an example of a race condition um, for a, a threaded program like this. Um, it greatly reduces it, but the underlying issue is still there because we are, um, the, these two threads are running concurrently um, and they are accessing a shared resource, a shared global variable uh, to read and write into it. And they're not doing anything to protect or synchronize their access of that variable, so they can they can potentially interfere with each other, right? So that, that's kind of all of our next um, unit um, um, after the second unit, where we talk about concurrency and concurrency mechanisms, semaphores, and things like that. Um, All right, so that was any, any questions about the problem set two. Um, so there's more, you know, more detailed discussion about all of that. But this is a good. This would be a good thing to understand if you want to have a leg up on understanding concurrency. So if you understand the issue that's happening here, um, I mean, this is all of kind of the first part of the first chapter for our next unit um, um, uh, talking about these concurrency mechanisms and why then that requires us to have uh, actual hardware mechanisms and software mechanisms for um, um, dealing with concurrency issues like, like this type of race condition um, that's affecting the update of the my global variable here. All right. So let's let's switch over to the um, um, assignment again. See if people want to ask some questions about that. So I had had one person asking some questions about the assignment. Um, let me close this folder off. Open my assignment back up. Um, so, one thing I want to mention here again, um, um, as I was discussing um, with uh, uh, someone previously. Um, so, so, so last week I talked a little bit about uh, last Thursday about um, how you can get started on uh, creating basically your process control block. So. At a minimum, you have to have some sort of a container. Um, so, so it could be as simple as a regular uh, C array um, to keep track of all the process instances that have been created and are being managed by the simulation. Right? But um, I mean, ultimately, um, in order to simulate the ready queue dynamics. So, so to, to simulate the, the round robin uh, queuing, you have to have a queue entity uh, for your ready queue. Um, and, and, in, and this is stuff that, um, you know, I'm, 
I'm assuming that you learned in data structures class, right? So you have to have a queue that you can enqueue uh, items to the end of the queue. So whenever new processes are created or whenever a process becomes unblocked or a process times out, it has to be enqueued to the end of the queue, uh, to the ready, into the ready queue. Uh, whenever you, you need to implement your dispatch, uh, you have to have that ready queue so that you can um, get the item off the front of the queue. That'll be the item, that'll be the process that's been waiting the longest to be scheduled next. Um, so you'll get the process from the front of the queue and dispatch it to the CPU to become the current running process and, and remove it then from the ready queue um, and have it uh, running on the system, okay? So um, you need to, you really need to use standard template library uh, containers, uh, a list or a queue to implement your ready queue. And if you don't know about using standard template library containers in C++, I've got a video for this, which people don't seem to know about. Um, it was back in the, it's in this, uh, well, it was in the, uh, the unit three or what I called three uh, here, including some example code. Um, so you might wanna look at that. So in particular, I mean, you, the, there is a queue object, so you can use a queue object. Um, you might wanna use a list, um, uh, which you'll find out later on why you might wanna use a list. So for example, if you wanna keep a list of strings, uh, but, but use it as a queue, um, you just have to, um, include the, the list container. You can include the queue container to use the, the basic uh, standard template library queue for, for implementing queues. Uh, but yeah, uh, but you can treat a list as a queue by simply pushing items onto the back. So a queue is a first in, first out. So that means that uh, like, like a queue at a grocery store, um, uh, whenever a, a person or a new item joins the queue, it goes to the back of the queue. So, so whenever you have a, a, an instance of a standard template library list that you want to use as a queue. You push items to the back of the queue to, to enqueue them. Um, and um, um, there, there are member methods uh, in our simulation that ask that in order to access what the current front item is on the queue and the back item, and kind of one of the reasons why I have those is so that we can do some testing, but, but those are also directly you can directly implement those by using a standard template library queue or a standard template library list um, and it has front and back which allows you to access the item at the front and back of your queue so that you can implement those methods in our um, um, in our simulation here for assignment two right um, but anyway yeah so you, you push things on the back if you want to use a list as a queue and you um, pop things from the front when you're ready to remove the front item from the queue so you can dispatch it and it becomes the ready the, the running process um, um, you know, the, the, the process that's currently running on your CPU um, all right so um, yeah there's another big hint on that since I since I was talking with uh, a student about that. Um, um, you can do something as simple as for your ready queue, um, you can do something as simple as using a, a queue or a list. If I'm gonna use a list instead of a queue, I need to include list. If I wanna use a queue, I need to include queue. Um, but you know, kind of a simple idea for the ready queue um, is just if I keep a list of process identifiers. So instead of instead of having a ready queue of a whole process object, so, so like I talked about last Tuesday, the, I mean your process table probably has to be a, a table of process of actual process instances. And, and also, like I said last time, though, uh, while you can implement it as a um, as a regular CRA, you know, you might be better off using a more high level container, like a list of processes or maybe a vector, All right? But for like your ready queue and maybe your block list, maybe not, uh, but, but definitely for your ready queue, something that's simpler is you, instead of keeping a whole process object on there, you could just keep the identifiers of the processes that are currently uh, in the ready queue. Right, but you definitely need a separate queue structure because you, again, in order to implement dispatching correctly and everything else correctly, you need to be able to know which is the current item that's at the front 
of your queue that's been waiting the longest um, so that you can uh, uh, remove it from the front of your queue and, and correctly dispatch that object, right? So if you have process identifiers, you would remove the process identifier and then you'd wanna use this as an index into your process table to um, change the state of that process from ready to running when you dispatch it to, be, to go from the ready, fr from, a, from being in a ready state to a, a running state um, and things like that, right? Uh, let me bring up the uh, assignment description here as well. If you have any questions, let me know. In particular, yeah. So, I mean, last time we mostly covered task one uh, last Thursday. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, once you get to implementing task two, I mean, at some point, uh, you will need to get your ready queue working. I mean, you, you can kind of stub it out to begin with, um, but um, 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 uh, somewhere once you're fully done with task two, you'll have to have a ready queue structure because in particular, Um, if I can go back to the tests here. So uh, in particular, the, um, the first set of test case really um, um, doesn't test anything that you're working on. It's not until you get to the second test case like we talked about, where it begins testing the stuff in task one. So the, the getter and setter methods, but you could, you could get past um, all of these tests by just um, stubbing out, um, like, um, um, you know, like just returning zero for the current ready queue size and returning idle for the ready queue front and back. Uh, but for the second one, or actually the, the, the third set of test cases uh, is actually, you know, testing task two for the most part here. Um, So to get these things right, so, so to get this one right, you have to have your process table because after you create a new process, uh, you need to be able to, when, I, when, when we ask the simulation to get a process with a picker ID, that you actually return the, the, uh, the, the process object instance that you created uh, in this new event, right? So to do this right, you have to have your process table. Um, but mostly then, I mean, right away to get these right, you probably also have to have your ready queue working. Um, um, I mean, you could just have member variables that, that keeps track of the number of processes that are on the ready queue. Uh, but, um, but yeah, by this point though, so after we create the second process, what we're saying here is that now we've created two new processes. Whenever a new process is created, uh, it immediately is put into the ready state. So both process one, um, so, so the first process will have a process ID of one. The second process that we create will have with, with the new event, we'll have a process ID of two. Um, um, and at that point, you know, your, your ready queue size should be two. So there should be two processes on the ready queue. Um, and at, at which point, you know, the, the process at the front of the ready queue should be process ID one. So the ready queue front should be returning the process identifier of the process that's at the front of the queue that's been waiting the longest, right? Which is process one here. Um, and then back should be returning the process identifier of the, the most recent process that was put onto the ready queue, which was two in this case, right? So process identifier two uh, was the second one created um, and is currently at the back of the ready queue. Um, All right. Does that make sense? Questions about, about your ready queue here or the task two? Um, 
So, I mean, after that, um, the, the next few tasks are implementing the basics of the round robin simulation. So, uh, you know, so, so these correspond to the uh, transitions in our seven state, or, or well, you know, really, really we're only using the main three or five states. We're not really doing any swapping um, in the simulation. So, so, so these correspond to the main transitions, um, you know, so dispatching um, is to go from the ready to the running um, process. Um, uh, the CPU event simulates one CPU cycle happening. So you have to do a couple things in there I'll talk about. Uh, and then timeout um, is one way that a process can go back to the ready state you know, to do round round queuing. If a process um, has used up its time slice quantum, uh, it should be timed out. So it should go back, so it should go from being the running process back to the end of the ready queue, right? Um, and then the last two or three have to do with uh, 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 blocking and unblocking on some sort of like IO or some sort of um, um, uh, event like that. Um, so for dispatch timeout um, in the CPU cycle, um, so besides the ready queue, you also have to have, have some idea of what the current running process is on your system. Right. Um, so initially, you know, when you start a simulation, the um, the CPU should be idle. Um, so I mean, you know, we were probably um, Uh, we were testing that. So, so the, the running process member method, uh, again, you can stub that out for like the first two tasks or so, um, but it should be returning idle. But once you get to the to, to dispatching, um, we're gonna have to be able to tell, like, like if I ask what's the running process, that you can tell me what the current running process is on the CPU, right? So for the, uh, the next set of um, um, The next set of unit tests that are testing your dispatch. Um, so we're we're reusing uh, um, our our, uh, our um, simulation for all these tests here. So the the, the simulation um, is defined as a global for all these test cases, um, and it has a time slice quantum of five. Just to explain this here. So what what that means is that. Um, 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 on these test cases here, we actually created two new processes and put them on the ready queue. So at this point, um, you know, no process is currently running, but we do have two processes um, in our simulation, um, and they're both uh, in ready states on the ready queue, right? So if you call dispatch, um, it should be taking the process at the front, which is process ID 1. So, so before we call dispatch, um, the, the CPU should be idle, so it should be returning true that the CPU is idle. Um, and if we ask for the running process, it should return idle. Um, so, so, so we return the the, um, the globally defined constant of idle, which is just zero. So, so we we don't we use PID one for the first first process ID, and we reserve the process ID of zero to indicate uh, an idle process or, or a, a non-existent process. But yeah, so after we dispatch, it should be the case that if we ask, you know, if we check the is CPU idle, that it's going to return false because now we should have a process running. And if we ask for what the running process is, it should return the PID of one because process one um, was created in the previous test case uh, and, and should be at the front of our ready queue, right? So when, once we dispatch, um, um, we get process one off, it becomes the running process. And then after that, your ready queue size is now back down, is, is down to one. So we had two processes. We took one process off the ready queue. It's now a uh, size of one now. And uh, there's only one process on there, process two. So process two is both at the front and the back of the ready queue at, at this point. Um, so again, I mean, you have to have something. We're, we're only simulating a single CPU system. But yet to implement these, like, like to implement, if I call running process, how do you how do you return back what the current running process is? Well, 
you know, again, you have to have something that keeps track of what the running process is. So, um, like at a minimum, again, you could just keep a member variable, um, like like um, you know, what is the what is the process running on the CPU? Yeah, it could be more descriptive, right? So, I mean, you can do other things, but that that's the simplest thing. So, when you dispatch a process, you could set so, so you, you can make sure this, this is initialized to be idle when the simulation is first created. Um, and you can, and whenever you do a dispatch and a new process is actually um, taken off the ready queue um, and uh, given to the CPU to start running, you can set it's the, the, this variable to be that ID of the process that you just dispatched, right? So when you have that, then, then you can use that to answer questions like, you know, so what's the running process? Well, you, you would get it out of that member variable. Um, there's a couple of other things. So, so dispatch, um, um, as it's described here, um, dispatch can be called when the CPU um, is already running a process. So, so what, what dispatch should do is it should first check if, if the CPU is idle. If the CPU is idle, then it should actually, you know, try and get a process off the, the front of the ready queue um, and make it become the running process. Right? If, if the CPU is not idle, um, um, dispatch should do nothing, um, which is what's being tested uh, here at this point. Uh, another thing you have to check for, which I'm sure is tested here, um, yeah, so, so here, um, uh, it is also the case that dispatch could be called um, and the CPU is idle, but also the ready queue is empty, right? So in that case, um, even though the CPU is idle, there's nothing on the ready queue um, that's ready to run. So again, in that case, the dispatch doesn't need to do anything, right? So the, the CPU would just stay idle in that case, um, since since there's nothing ready to be dispatched uh, and ready to be run, so 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 um, you kind of have two checks, right? So if the CPU is idle, um, or if the CPU is not idle, you don't have to do anything in your dispatch method, or if the ready queue is empty, um, you don't have to do anything. But if both if it's the if it's the case that both the CPU is currently idle and the ready queue um, has at least one process on it, um, I need to dispatch the processes at the front of the ready queue, make it become the running process on the system. All right, so that should, that should have all been kind of described um, on the task for the dispatch. Um, Questions about that? Um, so the next task um, is to implement the CPU event. Um, so this doesn't represent uh, doing one of those transitions in the state transition diagram. This represents simulating um, the, the, the CPU doing some work. So the main thing about this is that we need to really increment the system time and we need to increment the, the time quantum for the current running process so that we can check uh, when the, the process has timed out. And we, we can check when the process has exceeded its, its, its uh, time slash quantum so we can time it out correctly. So, um, So yeah, I think for um, for what you have to implement for the CPU event, um, um, you don't have to do, um, it, it, it's relatively simple. So I mean, somewhere we are checking all the things I just talked about. Um, um, so, so we're checking 
before uh, we do a CPU event, um, whether um, the CPU is idle and calling dispatch if we need to. Uh, and then after we do like a, a CPU cycle, uh, we're checking if the, the process has used up its time slash quantum, at which point the, the timeout gets called in the simulation. I have to go see if I can find where that logic happens. Um, so I, I guess that all you need to do for when you do your CPU event is increment the system time um, and increment the um, uh, the the time used on the particular process that's running. Okay. Uh, so again, here, if, if I didn't say it though, um, um, I mean it could be the case I think that the, that the CPU could be idle. Um, you know, so if no process is currently running, then you don't have to do anything for CPU event. But, but if there's a process currently running, then you have to do these things. Uh, th that's not true. So if no process is running, the system time would still be incremented by one, but only if you have a process running would the, the time used by that process be uh, incremented, right? So, um, so, Yeah, the, the next test case um, kind of call CPU event a couple of times. So after you call CPU event a couple of times, um, it should be the case that, that the system time is like at time four. So system time starts at time one. Um, so after three cycles, it'll be at time four. Um, and it should be the case that process one, so, so these things here, you might have to go look up uh, like this is in state, um, but um, Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, in particular, um, after process one runs, um, um, I mean, you know, it should have used up three um, CPU cycles, um, which is what one of these things is testing here. So uh, let's look at some of the details of this here real quickly. So So yeah, CPU event is, is completely empty here. Um, so if you want to understand this is in state, um, again, this method is mostly just in here so, so we can do this testing uh, easier here. So, um, So in this particular case, I mean, it's just a just returned true or false. So basically, all of these things have to be uh, uh, the same as what the current system state is um, in order for it to return true. So um, you know, so we're expecting that the um, um, oh, there, there's a there's a is in state for the simulation. There's also an is in state for individual processes. So for the simulation. You know, the, the first one is just what the, the, the system time slash quantum is, which should always be five. Uh, yeah, the next one is what the system time is. So after we run the CPU event three times, uh, the system time should now currently be uh, four. So it gets, it starts at one, it gets incremented three times, it's at four. Um, you know, so there's actually two processes in the system at this point, which were created um, in the previous tests here. Um, uh, neither of the processes is finished yet, so the number of finished process should be zero. Um, the running process is process ID one. Uh, the ready queue size, there's one process, which is process two in the ready queue. Um, and then, you know, the, the process at the front of the ready queue is two, and the process at the back of the ready queue is two. Um, and there's zero processes currently blocked, right? So that, that's what this is in state is doing, just checking that all these are, are what they should be, right? And for you, you know, to pass this first one, basically all you have to do is increment the system time, right? And then to pass the second one, um, um, 
Uh, process one is running. So um, in, in your CPU um, event, uh, um, if there is a process running, you also need to call the, um, let me open up the process HTTP. So, so uh, to do a lot of this work, um, uh, you, you'll be calling methods. Uh, you know, so instead of doing it by hand, you'll be calling methods or corresponding methods for a process object that you have. So, so if you know that process one is currently running, so for every CPU event, you want to call the CPU cycle for the process, right? And, and that will actually increment the, the time slash quantum. Um, so we can look at the implementation of that. Um, for the process, so so the you know that increments the time used and the the quantum used. But in particular, it increments the the quantum used um, uh, for the process every time you call CPU event for the process, right? Um, so anyway, I mean you know so it, just by calling that, it will increment the 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 total amount of time that the process used and the total amount of time it's used in its current time slice quantum, right? And then again, you can check this. So so after the the, the process runs three times. Um, so, so if we look at the is in state for um, an individual process, um, it should be the case that um, um, that process one is in the running state, right? Um, so, so process one that, that we're calling is in state on is the current running process. So it's in, in the running state. Uh, it started at system time one. Um, um, and it's currently used three time time steps. So, so in total, it's run for three clock cycles because it was running for these three um, simulated CPU events, right? Likewise, um, it was running um, three quantums in its current time slice quantum. Um, so so um, that's this third parameter here. So, um, and it's currently only, so it's not waiting on any event. So it's not currently blocked. So only if it's waiting, uh, if it's currently blocked, will it have a particular event ID of the of, of what it's waiting uh, to occur before it becomes unblocked. Uh, that's the last parameter on the is in state here. Um, So uh, yeah, I mean, again, if you're doing this right, so for example, um, after you call it three more times, um, um, the process should have used like six time slice quantums. Um, and in particular, if we ask for the process, if its quantum is exceeded, where, where the uh, time slice quantum uh, for the system is five, and it should be returning true now um, um, because yeah, I mean, it's used six currently um, and the, the, the limit is supposed to be five. So it's true that it's quantum has been exceeded at this point. Um, okay, so I had a question here. So um, um, yeah, how do you check the process is idle? I mean, there's lots of ways. Um, um, you could use number of running processes. Um, I mean, I do recommend, though, that um, at a minimum, um, I mean, you do need to have some variable that keeps track of what the current process is that's running. So, um, I mean, another way is however you do that, like if you use a PID, um, you should be setting that to be idle whenever the CPU is idle. So that'd be one way you could check it is, um, if, if the whatever you're using to keep track of what process is running on the CPU, whatever that's idle, then the CPU is idle. So that's another way. I mean, you could use other things. You could use like a, a whole process instance here. So if you did that, um, again, though, you'd, you'd want to set this to a particular value um, when you don't actually have a process currently running. So you'd, you'd want to set it to the idle process um, in that case. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, so there are different ways that you could test whether the CPU is idle or not. Um, 
Okay, and then um, um, just a few more words about timeout, and then I, I might kind of leave these till Thursday a bit to, to talk in more detail. Um, so we've already kind of talked about the, the basics that you need then to get the timeout to work. Um, so if you're correctly incrementing the uh, quantum use for the running process, you should be able to um, use that is quantum exceeded in the timeout function on the current running process to determine uh, whether it should be timed out or not. Um, So, uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the work that you're doing for the, the timeout that you're going to implement in the simulation is, I mean, you first have to check if, if it's quantum has been exceeded. So if there is a process that's currently running, check if it's quantum has been exceeded or not. If it has, then you have to time it out. So the way you time it out is you have to change its state back to a ready state. So you have to call the ready function on the process to make it ready. And you have to enqueue it back to the end of your ready queue. So, you, so you'll push it and, and you need to make your CPU become idle now. So, so after you um, um, time out a process and return it back to the ready queue, um, your CPU should now be idle at that point, um, have nothing running on it. Um, all right, and um, yeah, sorry, twelve ten here. Um, so the last three have to do with the other part of the state transition diagram. So simulating uh, like a, a process doing some I/O, um, so becoming blocked um, and then later on that IO finishing. So whatever event it became blocked on, that event occurs and becomes unblocked, okay? So for the block event, uh, basically kind of like timeout, but but you, you need to, um, um, if a process is running on the CPU, you need to transition it from being running to being blocked. Um, and, and again, there's a method uh, for the process that you should call to actually block it you may or may not need a separate data structure. So like for your ready queue, you might wanna have a data structure to, that keeps track of all the processes that are um, currently blocked, waiting on some event, okay? In particular, um, kind of as a hint here, uh, using a dictionary or a map um, is a nice data structure here. You don't have to, but but the idea is that when, when you implement the unblock, what you need to do is you need to find out which process is waiting on that event ID so you can unblock that process, right? So if you use a dictionary that, that you could look up uh, which process is blocked on a particular event ID, then you could just directly like use your dictionary or your map to find, okay, this process is blocked on this event ID. So now I can get that process and unblock it, right? Um, but you don't have to, I mean, you could use just a regular list, uh, or you could even just use your um, use your process control block and just like uh, search through all of your process control block to find all of the block processes uh, and then find which block process is waiting on that particular event ID, right? So there's lots of ways that you could um, look through your block processes and, and unblock the one that's waiting on the particular event ID for the unblock. Um, event here. So. Um, oh, and but yeah, so when you unblock an event, though, it needs to go back to a ready state and you need to push it back to the end of your ready queue at that point as well. So that's other stuff that you need to do. Um, and then finally, there's one more event transition. So uh, we do allow the simulation of a running process finishing doing this task. So if a done event occurs, if there's a process currently running on the CPU, it should be transitioned from running to be done, right? Um, so uh, again, um, um, at a minimum, I mean, you just need to um, 
set your CPU back to idle um, and um, set the um, uh, state for the that process to like a done state or something like that. All right, um, uh, any questions about things here? I kind of want to wrap up. Uh, we can go, uh, we got one more class session um, before the um, this assignment is due. So we can talk about things again then. Um, all right. Um, if I don't get any more questions here, I'm going to go ahead and end the session and try and get the video posted. I think we had a good video here. So I think the IT issues are finished with the um, classroom. So I'll try and be in the classroom um, on Thursday as well if anybody um, wants kind of face to face stuff. Uh, but yeah, that's it for the session. Keep sending email questions or show up on Thursday um, if you have some questions about assignment two. And I'll see you guys later then.